After we saw the crew bring their train down Brown Street in the morning, we return in the afternoon spotting the Alco S6 tied to a lengthy consist on the main, apparently ready to take all these cars to the interchange on the other side of town. Once again, the conductor gets down to begin the walk up the street to flag traffic to a halt ahead of the train. Today's consist is a massive 10 cars, unusual to see on the M&H, though an uptick in storage traffic has left the railroad jammed with cars over the winter of 22. I'm set up for a shot of them passing the famed Cuppy's Diner, a staple in this part of town for over four generations nearing 90 years of service. They're closed by this time in the afternoon, now a few minutes past three. But if you hurry in between 7 and 12 in the morning, Tuesday through Sunday, you can treat yourself to a great breakfast with a front row seat to the tracks. Not even clear of the yard, 151 struggles to lug the consist, dropping back to idle several times after attempting to notch up. Smoke isn't just coming from the stack, but also from the wheels, perhaps resulting from a ground fault or wheel slip. After several attempts, the 151 seems to load and chugs along at walking speed. Including the locomotive, the nine loaded storage cars, and one empty on the rear from a customer east of town weigh in at just over 1,400 tons and about 465 feet in length. It may not seem like much, but Brown Street experiences an 11-foot rise from the yard to Wood Street a quarter mile to the west, averaging a 0.8% grade putting the 66-year-old 900-horsepower Alco switcher to the test. Everything seemed to be going fine once they crossed South Union Street when the locomotive started experiencing problems again. The engineer tries to keep the heavy consist inching forward, but with the whole train on the hill and the locomotive across the flat portion of track over the crossing, it doesn't look hopeful they'll be able to regain traction for the steepest part of the climb. The conductor heads to the rear of the train to protect the shove, but not without one last attempt to get a moving before throwing in the towel. It also doesn't help that tracks shared by a roadway may accumulate oil runoff from cars, possibly creating slick rails.
Storing cars is often the result of fluctuations in commodity prices. Empties are stored during periods of economic downturn, whereas a customer that orders large amounts of product that can change price by the ton will stock up on loads before the next price hike, but may not have enough room in the industry sidings to house all the cars. To avoid paying demerage and switching fees resulting from poor service by the big railroads, it may often make more economic sense to pay a daily fee to a small railroad to hang onto the cars until there is enough capacity where they're needed. A number of sweeteners, oils, and kindred products are hauled in 40-foot tank cars like these. We know it's a non-regulated load due to the absence of hazardous materials placards. Unlike the last car in the consist, which is an empty chlorine tanker retaining placards for the residues remaining in the car. The corn syrup labels on these tank cars are crossed out, so I'm not sure what they're carrying. Back down they go, deciding it best to break the train in half and double up the street to the interchange. Doubling, or even tripling, is a term referring to how many moves it takes to get a train over a steep hill. This is not common practice on main lines today, though many short lines with older locomotives without high horsepower and tractive effort may routinely do this task. I can't say I've ever seen a train double over a section of street running, but with the cut made and the conductor back on board, we'll now get to witness it firsthand. I set up for the second half of the train on top of the old siding at Carnes between Union and Catherine Street. Only 15 minutes has passed since they dropped the other cut, wasting no time with this one either.
This angle gives a better view of the tracks climbing to the same grade as the adjacent electrified Amtrak Philadelphia to Harrisburg line as they make their way over South Wood Street without any issues. The cars are finally reunited at the interchange a half hour after the whole ordeal began. They'll spend some time working here before proceeding light back to the yard to end their day. I wait for them to return by Cuppies while 151 takes the usual pause by Carnes to let drivers clear the alley as the conductor stops additional traffic on South Union Street before proceeding. The other conductor that assisted to flag the roadway is pretending to be a train by following closely behind in his car, ignoring the one way through the alley, getting a good laugh from the conductor riding the engine. Freight and passenger trains can be seen on Brown Street dozens of times throughout the year, keeping the tradition of street running alive and well in central Pennsylvania. I hope you enjoyed part two of the Middletown and Hummelstown freight operations, and for more information on the railroad and passenger excursions, please go to mhrailroad.com to plan your visit today. In July of that year, I caught one of the passenger trains heading north over Route 230, led by M&H No. 1 a former U.S. Army GE 44-tonner wearing a Leslie RS-5T, a mighty horn for such a small locomotive. The 100-plus-year-old former Delaware Lackawanna MU coaches will continue several miles up the jointed rail of the Milk and Honey Line with views along the Swatera Creek before shoving back to Middletown. That's all I have for this video, so I hope you check out my other videos from the area and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I look forward to hearing your comments below, and as always, thanks for watching.